Hello again. I hope you have been enjoying the concepts that we have discussed so far in this series. Today, we will discuss about the constraining of degrees of freedom. But before we do that, please take a moment to hit the subscribe button and join us in this wonderful journey of learning structural engineering with Snap Pro. Now let us consider this weightless ball here to be connected to this rigid rod which is being anchored to this wall. And we are trying to pull this ball in the positive direction of the x-axis. But will the ball move? No, it won't. But as we have understood uh, from the last videos that this ball, if a force is applied, will not move only if the net force acting on this ball is zero. So how is the net force acting on this ball is zero? Well, let us find out. Let us conceptually separate this ball and this rigid rod. We do it in our minds. Okay. So, and this is the rigid rod. We separate the two. Okay. Now, when we try to pull the ball with force P, the force would be transmitted onto this rigid rod. So, the rigid rod would also be pulled in this direction P. Now, you probably remember the Newton's third law of motion which states that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Now, this ball is actually transmitting the force to this rod. So, this ball is actually, we are pulling this ball, the ball is pulling this rod. So, as an equal and opposite reaction, the rod pulls the ball back with the same force. So now, look at the, this free body diagram of the ball. So, you would see that there are two equal and opposite forces that are acting on the ball. So, this results in this condition. And as a result, the ball is in equilibrium. Now, if we consider this force to be in the vertical direction, acting along the y, what would happen? The free body diagram would change. So now, We are pulling this ball in the vertical direction P. The ball in turn would pull this rod in this vertical direction P. And the rod would apply an equal and opposite force to this ball P. So we would see that the resultant force in the y direction would be zero and thus the condition summation fy equal to zero is satisfied and hence even if you pull the ball in the y direction the ball will not move. The same thing will happen if you try and apply the force in the z direction. Now think of a condition where you apply a moment mz on the ball. So, if this diagram would change. You uh, draw this again. So, this is the rigid, uh, the rigid rod and this is the ball and now we apply this moment mz. So, see this is x, this is y, so z should be this, so this should be mz. So, this force is being transmitted to this rigid rod like this and this force will now try to bend the rigid rod. As an equal and opposite reaction, the rigid rod would apply an equal and opposite force which is an equal and opposite moment on this particular ball. So we had applied an anti-clockwise moment mz to the ball, 
this rod will apply back an equivalent apposit that is a clockwise MZ moment on this ball and thus this ball would not rotate because the summation of moment about z-axis is zero as I have said this moments are equal and opposite. Similarly, if we apply a moment about x like this or about y, the ball will not move because this rod will apply an equal and opposite moment to the ball and prevent it from rotating. The ball would have happily moved around in space if it were subjected to forces and moments in their respective directions. However, in this case, we have constrained the degrees of freedom with the help of a mechanical arrangement in the form of a rigid rod and an anchor. We can provide such external constraints and those external constraints are called supports. But why do we need to constrain the degrees of freedom at all? Well, the structure is intended to serve a specific purpose and it would not help much if the structure were moving around in space, isn't it? So it's very important to constrain the degrees of freedom so that the structure doesn't undergo rigid body motions. Constraining the degrees of freedom is called as applying supports to the structure or supporting the structure. In the next video, we will learn three basic types of supports which we will be using extensively in this course. I hope you have understood the concepts. If you have liked this video, please hit the like button and please press the bell icon for more notifications from the Structural Insider channel. See you again in the next video. Till then, goodbye.